uh, Toronto, and I'm tired, and um, I um, I didn't do a very good job eating today. Uh, herb, herb. Um, what else? <laughs> Yeah, you're asking me, my mom. I um, I uh, went to several meetings. I heard my friend um, Carmen Robertson give a talk today, which was pretty fun and funny and smart. And then I had a meeting, and then I had another meeting. Yeah, at least I keep going. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. No, no, you're right. You're right. I know. Are you ready for you ready for um can I read uh read some Taltan stuff to you? What? Can I read some Taltan stuff to you? Yeah. No, no, I'm going to read it to you right now. No, 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 I'm going to read to you. You don't have to go. It's called Listen Taltan people are talking. You ready? This is the introduction. The Association of United Taltans, who have sponsored and encouraged the production of this, of this fascinating collection of legends, owe a real debt of gratitude to Vera Asp and Angela Dennis, two young Taltan women who have put so much of their time and commitment into collecting, transcribing, and editing these legends. They are convinced that only through knowledge from knowing their heritage and traditions can the Taltans ever hope to regain control of their lives and their land. There are some 2,000 Taltans who live in the area of northern British Columbia that is up against the Yukon border around such communities as Telegraph Creek, Iskut, Deese Lake, and Good Hope Lake. <clears throat> They organized themselves in 1974 to begin the arduous task of developing a land claims for themselves and their children so that some form of self-government and self-determination could be realized. The Association of United Taltans, which receives no funding from the government, meets yearly in July to meet to plan the future for this proud and independent tribe which belongs to the Athabascan linguistic group. In seeking to achieve a just settlement of their land claims, the Taltan stress political, economic, social, and cultural control over their land and its resources. They believe that a tribal land claim is important for their survival within BC, uh, within the BC context so that native organizations can regain control of their own destiny. Vera and Angela have been joined by well-known artist Dempsey Bob, whose unique okay. You ready? Yeah. Okay, I'm just reading the introduction. It's the first page of the book. Dempsey Bob, whose unique drawings add depth to an already rich booklet, and they offer it to their people and to the people of Canada as a part of the heritage of the Indians of this country. You ready? Okay. The first one is called, and it says a Taltan story. This is our people's story, okay? Okay? Okay. Uh, a long time ago, there was only darkness. And during this dark period, everything and everyone were happy with the situation. Then there was this man who had a young teenage daughter whom he kept in a house by herself under strict rules. She wasn't allowed to wander about by herself. This man was also the keeper of light. He managed the daylight, sunlight, and moonlight. 
These lights were about five inches in diameter, and the Indian people called it Dih. Dih? Dih? The lights were hung along the side of the wall. Are you okay? <laughs> you coughed it out? <laughs> uh, Dith. The lights were hung on the side of the wall, and this man regarded them as valuables. One day, a stranger came along and knocked on the door. The stranger appeared as an old man, a tired old man. This tired old man was known as Siskiyacho, meaning Siskiyacho. So the, say that, Siskiyacho, Siskiyacho. 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 Yeah. Siskiyacho. Siskiyacho. Oh no, there's more. There's more. You don't get off the phone too quick. So the light manager, that's a real telltale phrase, eh? Light manager answered the door and let his visitor in. The tired old man sat down and visited for a certain length of time. Just as the daughter appeared, Siskiyacho disappeared. That was the tired old man. The young girl said she was thirsty and needed a drink of water. Father went to fetch her some water in a woven willow basket. Just a sec. As the young girl was about to drink the water, she noticed a small black speck in the water, so she refused to drink. Her father spilled the water, but he never got rid of the speck. This black speck of dirt lodged itself out of sight in the basket. Finally, the daughter had to drink the water and swallow the speck without knowing. It was late... I know. Weird, right? It was later when the Indian people had realized the speck was the Siskiyacho in disguise. For during that year, the light chief's daughter had a baby boy while living isolated. The baby grew amazingly strong as the days passed. One morning, one morning as the baby began to cry endlessly, his grandparents inquired what was upsetting him, and he pointed to the disk of daylight. So the baby had his request granted, and that kept him quiet until he fell asleep with the daylight at his side. So he got it off the wall. He got it off the wall. The next morning, he woke up again in a foul mood and cried until his grandparents gave him the sunlight. The baby repeated this crying spell until he got the moonlight. His grandfather didn't allow anyone to lift these discs even a foot off the ground, fearing he would lose the light to the world. As several days passed, the baby grew stronger, and he was very contented with his new toys, the lights. He rolled them around on the floor surface and bounced them around about when his grandparents weren't watching. One day... One dark day, he picked up the daylight and the sunlight in his hands, walked to the open entrance of their house, and then he threw the daylight from his right hand, next the sunlight, and last the moonlight. Then as he was flying away like a crow does, ka ka, Oh, I could do better. Ka <laughs> This, exactly, do better, do better. This had frightened all of the animals, and they have since scattered into distant, different areas of the land. This is why we see the goat and sheep in the mountain, the fish in the water, the gopher underground, the huge animals amongst the humans too. All of the animals were frightened into where they are today, except the bear. The bear became very angry at the sudden change. As he jumped up to put his boots on, he cursed and somehow managed to put them on crooked. 
This is why you see the bear with crooked paws on tracks today. And that's it. And it says here that the story was told by Emma Brown and taped by Angela Dennis and edited by Vera Asp. That's pretty cool. Yeah, that's pretty cool. I like it. Well, you're very wise, too. I, I learned it uh, honestly. From you. Ha, 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 ha. Yeah, we love you, too, with all our heart and soul. <laughs> but I, um, I have to... Um, I have to finish getting ready for school. I teach in two hours. I gotta read one more thing. So I should talk to you later, okay? I love you too, my mom. Bye. <laughs>